Hello out there. Welcome to your next mission video podcast. Today we're celebrating Black History Month with a couple of good friends of mine who are my counterparts in the Marines and the Coast Guard. We always have a great discussion when we get together. So stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome to Your Next Mission video podcast, where we tell the stories of those who have served in the past and those who are serving today. From transition to financial wellness, VA benefits to mental health, we cover issues facing veterans, active military, and their families. Now here's your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilly. Hello out there, warriors, past and present, and your families, and thank you for your service to our great country. Before we get started, I personally want to thank our presenting sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, whose members are their mission, and Purdue Global, where you can start a comeback. With additional sponsorship from Blue Cross Blue Shield, FEP Dental, Blue Cross Blue Shield, FEP Vision, and USAA. Together, they make your next mission happen. They love our veterans and families, and I'm going to say it every week, we love them too. Today we're celebrating Black History Month, and of course the history of African Americans in the nation's military is a big part of that. And I'm so excited to introduce to my guest, the 14th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Alfred L. McMichael, and the 8th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Dr. Vincent W. Patton III. Thank you both for coming on the show. Thank you. Glad to be with you, Jack. Now you're clamming up. I want you to get aggressive like you are. <laughs> hey, before we get started, can each one of you uh, tell the audience just a little bit about yourself? And Al, we'll start with you. And I'm not going to call you Sergeant Major the Marine Corps and Master Chief. I'm going to call you Al and Vince. So we're going to start with you, Al. Tell, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, I appreciate the fact that you're going to call me something decent. And Al is quite <laughs> quite acceptable. <laughs> it's a difference. Yeah. It? But uh let me start by saying uh, I'm very proud to be a part of your show to, uh, today, uh, Sergeant Major Tilly. And uh, I'm Al McMichael. Uh, I uh, reigned from the great state of Arkansas about 50-some years ago. I joined the United States Marine Corps. And fortunately for me, I had the opportunity to serve in every component of the Marine Corps, from the infantry, from the logistics, to the aviation, to the C-suite. And then by some grace, um, I found myself serving as the 14th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have an extended time on active duty. When I left the post of Sergeant Major Marine Corps, I went to uh, Allied Command, uh, Supreme Allied Command of NATO and became the first Sergeant Major of, of the Supreme Allied Command of, of uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I'm very fortunate. Um, I have been uh, married to my bride of uh, 47 years, and we have one daughter and two two grandsons that I'm very, very proud of. And I take great pride in being a part of an organization that calls itself the Armed Forces of America. Even in retirement, it still makes my, my hair on the back of the neck stand up when I'm amongst those that call themselves honorable veterans. Oh, thanks a lot, Al. Vince, how about yourself? Well, hello, everybody. And uh, and Jack, thank you so much for having Al and us back. Uh, well, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am very proud to say, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, let me say that again. Detroit, Michigan, <laughs> which uh, is there a reason. No, never mind. <laughs> which I started out my uh, Coast Guard career uh, right out of high school uh, uh, when I joined in 1972. I uh, spent 30 wonderful years in the Coast Guard in a variety of assignments, first starting out in the field of uh, communications and uh, later moving into personnel and training and also uh, trained as a uh, a maritime law enforcement boarding officer. So over the course of my 30 years, I, I crisscrossed all over the country, including a trip to Alaska, as well as down to uh, Haiti and to Guantanamo Bay as well. So I had a wonderful, illustrious career. Uh, one of the unique things that occurred during the course of my career, I was able to work on my education. Uh, like I said, I came in right out of high school. And by the time I retired, in, 19, in 2002, uh, I had already earned my doctorate degree all through the great, wonderful 
uh, opportunities that were offered uh, through the Coast Guard as well as in the military as, as a whole, taking advantage of the tuition assistance program, uh, getting involved into a, a program that the Coast Guard actually sent me away to uh, work on my doctorate degree, which was the development and implementation of the enlisted evaluation system. In retirement, I've uh, continued to do uh, things that I enjoy, particularly uh, teaching. I currently teach leadership and ethics for Northeast Maritime Institute and also serve uh, as an advisor for uh, a, um, a mortgage company. And uh, and then just got my fingers in every doggone thing you can imagine that some of it, mostly Coast Guard, involved with the building of the National Coast Guard Museum and all kinds of other stuff. Well, before we get started asking you questions, uh, I, I just want to say thank you for your friendship because right? we've been friends for, geez, I, I was trying to figure it out today. Maybe I was probably got the number, but it's, it has to be over 30 plus years. At it? least. I think it yes. is. Yeah, at least. Yes, because I, met you, hey, I uh, met you before you became Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's been Sergeant a Sergeant Major of the Army. Been... No, Sergeant Major. <laughs> Wait a minute, I don't want to say anything about Al. I also met Al before he became Sergeant Major in the Marine Corps, too. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, this year's theme for Black History Month is artists and artisans. And Al, when we, we talked recently, you mentioned that uh, you can't really tell a story about African-American artists without, you know, mentioning some of the great artists who have served. And, and I'd like to include, you know, the athletes. Uh, you know, her, her artist in their own right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I don't, I don't know if I can really focus on art, artists and archery because I don't want to limit it to the fact that everything that we talk about has to be on canvas or drawn. A uh, lot, lot of art and, and artists create other things, you know, whether they become cooks or whether they become athletes or whether they become poets. You know, when I, I think about the artists in, in in my path, I I have to stop and think about people like Roberto Clemente, uh, uh, you know, the the great baseball player that served in the Marine Corps and the infantry, uh, uh, Ken Norton, who um, I served with in San Diego during the early 70s, who uh, was so so adamant about playing football until the Marine Corps got rid of the football team and that play, played uh, real football, and, and he didn't want to go back to doing the real things that Marines do. So he joined the, uh, the boxing team, you know, the Leon Spinks of the world, all of these kinds of individuals that were artists uh, in their own way. At some think time, when we say artists, you think they have to be able to sing like the Motown of, of Vince Patton or, or dance like the, the Toe Tampas of Jack Tilly, but actually they have, Wait a minute. They, they have more to offer than that. And, you know, I, I think about the archery of, of how they pave a road when you think back to the Montfort Point Marines who, who drew a path for people like me to follow and to have to walk on. You know, the, the Marine Corps uh, didn't have any black Marines in it until 1941, and, and then they joined up in 42. And a lot of people don't understand. They, they Many, many of the Montfort Point, the first black Marines to join the Marine Corps, uh, despite it was not acceptable uh, it, within the Marine Corps. Even the Commandant was against uh, bringing um, Negroes into the Marine Corps at that point. But they, their archery, I think they painted, they drew, they developed, they created, they made a path for all that will follow them some many years later until uh, President Obama awarded them the Congressional Gold Medal for their contributions. So when I think of art, artists and archery, I think of uh, a bigger scope of what they have developed and left behind for us to follow. Yeah. Now, really to follow up, do you think that their time in the military may have given them some, you know, the foundation they needed to achieve success in the sports and, and different things? I mean, when I think about myself and probably think about you guys too, the, the military, there's no question in my mind, changed my life. It, it made me look at things a little bit differently. How do you think it affected them by being in the military? Well, I think you have to look at that from two two sides, Jake. Uh, it changed some people's life that had that already had a life of privilege. It didn't really change people's life who was struggling other than to have prepared them to struggle in an environment that they thought that they were fighting for freedom, but come home and it wasn't free at all. And, um, you know, to to go off to World War One or World War Two and you come home and you still can't, uh, sit in a restaurant to to eat, but you fought for that restaurant to exist. You couldn't ride on a bus 
uh, like everybody else, but you fought for that bus to have the right to be filled up and drive down Main Street of America. But uh, it, it changed a lot of life but in different ways. Uh, a lot of black Marines' lives were changed because they, they had to be tough enough to endure the social uh issues of life, but now they have to deal with those same, uh, some of the same issues in uniform because just because they put a uniform on, they didn't, they didn't, uh, stop doing the things that they were doing before they came in. Everybody wasn't fortunate enough to be around the Jack Tilly, uh, as I was that looked at everybody as, as himself or, or the same. Many times we had to deal with things that would take us totally, uh, you know, you would say, well, you gotta be forgiving. It's okay to forgive. But you can't forget, not that you you don't want to forget, but how do you forget when the same things are happening today that was happening in 1942? I forgive for what for the shortcomings that those that had privileges that got to do. But I can't forget because they're still doing the same thing. Many of. them. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, it's it's. Uh, yeah, I think you guys know my story. When I grew up, I, there was very few minorities in my community when I grew up. So when I went into the military, uh, it was a. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It was all normal, and I didn't, I didn't see those kind of things. But I remember one time when you was talking. I remember one time I went to a, a club one time, and I had a good friend. His name was uh, Al Alfonso, and, and we went over there to get a couple drinks. And when I started to go in, they wouldn't let him in. And I, th and I'd never seen anything like that before. And so, uh, so I went and asked the guy, and the guy said something. I said, well, I don't want to tell you the, the words I used, but, but, I, but I said, if you won't let him in, then I don't want to go in your your uh, blank club anyway. So you lay down and left. And, and I was, I was, uh, I didn't think those things went on, but as I got older in the military, I did see them. And, and I think maybe I have my eyes closed sometimes. And I think that's, that's what happens to a lot of people. Sometimes their eyes are closed and they don't see those kind of things because it doesn't affect them. And I, and I always talk about, you guys know that, uh, you know, Johnny Meyer has been my friend for a long, long time. But I remember one time, Johnny commented to me, he says, you know, every time I go uh, through the airport, through two TSA, they always stop me. I said, ah, nah, come on now, that's got to be baloney. And uh, so one time we was traveling together and, and I was with him and they stopped both of us. And so when the guys started checking us all out, you know, they do the take your shoes off and all that stuff. And, uh, and I think it, it, it probably woke me up. Now that was, I guess I was 60 plus years old when I see that. And so it amazes me that... Uh, that people don't grow, don't develop. They, you know, I, I agree with you. You got to, you got to remember about history, but you got to move forward in life. And I think sometimes uh, people are just so, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to call them. They just, they just don't grow, and it just really upsets me sometimes. This is a, that's why I love the military so much because it's a, it's a melting pot. You can learn about each other, so it's, it's important. Hey, hey Vince, when we, uh, we've come a long way in the military when it comes to diversity since. Uh, you know, some of those men have served and some of the women have served. Hopefully, you both have seen growth in, the, in that area since you first, you know, signed up. And I guess my question to you is, what was it like when you came in the early days in the Coast Guard? Did you see those kind of things? Well, you know, uh, the Coast Guard, f for the most part, especially in the people of color community, African-American communities uh, specifically, know very little about the Coast Guard as a whole. So when I came in the Coast Guard in 1972, uh, you know, I don't think they kept numbers, at least accurate numbers, to say, you know, what was the percentage of the Coast Guard in terms of, of uh, uh, diversity and so forth. But I know it was a very, very small, single-digit number somewhere estimated at that level. So what that means is, is that I came in and there were very few uh, people that looked like me. Uh, so was it tough? Well, to some degree it was, but I will tell you that the bigger challenges that I faced was not as much as the people who I served with initially when I came in, but uh, uh, when I went to areas where they were virtually uh, no African Americans, and let me give you a quick, quick, quick story about this. Is when um, after I graduated from uh, from boot camp in Cape May, New Jersey, I went off to Radioman School in Petaluma, California, which is about sixty miles north of San Francisco. Uh, I had it was a class of ten of us. And uh, and the ten of us that were uh, there for the first four weeks, as it was a twenty-four week school, the first four weeks we couldn't leave the base. And when we left the base to go out on Liberty into the town of Petaluma, uh, four of us 
decided to go off and uh, take in a movie and to uh, 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 eat and so forth. And you know, I was the only black in the comp- uh, in, in my class. Anyway, uh, we go to we go to dinner. We take a movie, and then we're getting ready to go back to the base, which was 10 miles from town. There was a place we had to stop and wait for the Liberty bus to come and pick us up. Sometimes the locals would drive by and would take us up to the base. This was a case where a car pulled up, and a lady in a station wagon says, you guys going to the Coast Guard base? And we say, yes. And she says, well, I go right by there and hop in. So uh, as the four of us began to get into her station wagon, just as I put my hand on the door, she told me no. And she called me about every name that you ever want to mention. Uh, and, wow. uh, and so, but here's the good part of the story here is that uh, my three other classmates, uh, all of a sudden they got out of the car and one of them got really nasty and angry with the lady for calling me the names uh, and, you know, said that, you know, that was uncalled for and so forth. So so while I endured a situation in a community where uh, I was the only black, uh, my shipmates were there for me. And I think a lot of that have to do, as you said earlier, Jack, is about, uh, you know, we're a melting pot when you come into the military. And when people began to know a little bit more about you and learn about you and so forth, as this was the case while I was in radio school, the first four weeks, we all got to know each other, that uh, those three guys that I traveled with, you know, I was their buddy and they were not going to let anything happen to me. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you know, we all was around General Powell there, you know, quite a few times. You guys probably seen him more times than I did, but but throughout my military career, I've probably seen him 10 or 15 times. He's always such a, a gracious person to be around and, and a wonderful person to listen to. But I remember, uh, you guys probably know the story better than I do, but I remember him telling us a story. I, I, I've heard it two or three times. I guess he went to West Point, and when he got to West Point, uh, they was going to, or maybe it's command or staff college, I'm not sure, but they was going to, they selected him for uh, for command. And he was in the room. His roommate uh, was a was a white guy, and and so he come back all steamed up, and he was saying, you know, I I can't understand what they're saying. I said, what do you mean? He says, uh, he said the only reason you've been selected for command because uh, because you're black. And he says, let's go down there and tell him. I guess he would probably want to go down there and fight with him. I'm not sure. And, but General Powell said something I thought was really smart. He says, no, I'm not going to go down there. I'm going to show him. I'm going to show them why they selected me for a command. I always thought it was a, I, I'm sure you've heard that story too, but I always thought that was a pretty interesting, uh, interesting story. But, Al, did you have a lot of, uh, go ahead. I was going to say ahead. that actually happened at uh, Fort Leavenworth. Uh, when he, oh, yeah. That story that, that he talked about. Yeah, he, he was, again, going back to General Powell, he was, he was probably one of the most gracious persons that I've ever met. And, and in fact, every time we all got around him or either, collectively or individually is just such a such a great role model really not just uh for the military really for our country so i i just i really had a lot of respect for him hey, al did you have a lot of officers or senior non-commissioned officers that looked like you when you was growing up in the marine corps absolutely not uh yeah i i the first commission officer uh black officer that i served with i was already an e8 a well-established marine on my own but he was the first one that ever had the opportunity to write evaluations on me uh, as a, a professional Marine. But other than that, and, and that drives a point that people don't understand. Be- before you think that the military didn't change a lot of people, the question I, I say to minorities, especially black, if there were no one in the ranks of commission officer that wrote eval on you, how did you get evaluated? Uh, elevated to the next rank. How did you get promoted? Yeah. So yeah. somewhere the military had changed the, the 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 culture, the mindset of people that didn't like you before they came in, didn't understand why you were there, but learned to live with you and learn to be fair and just uh, with uh, evaluation. You know, uh, Joan Powell wasn't the only one that went through that. You can check the, uh, the Marine Times of 1999 and I was selected as the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. And the I call it my paper because it's a Marine paper. And, and the first first thing they wrote about me is, who is he? He he hadn't been anywhere, hadn't done anything, and nobody knows him, you know? And uh, so 
you you go through all of these trials and tribulations, but as Vince said, it only made me stronger. What you don't know about me is my advantage uh, of defe- defeating you because the less you know about me, the more I can I can penetrate your your so called fake fake shield of, of armor, and uh, so I was never afraid to to take my positions. Uh, I kind of got a little perturbed sometimes because they say, "Oh, he's the first black sergeant major of the Marine Corps." How about I was the uh, the 14th sergeant major that got there because I was qualified, because I I was capable of doing my job, because I had walked the walk in the Marine Corps to have the credentials that everybody else had, but I was selected. So you know, uh, I don't put a lot of faith in that when they say you're the first black sergeant major of the Marine Corps. I was the first black of a lot of things in the Marine Corps. You know. I was, I was the first one to, to teach at, at uh, embassy school where they train Marines. I was the first one to teach at uh, the b- first black uh, AMOI at the University of Minnesota. I was the first black to do numerous things, to be the, the director of the Leadership Academy for the West Coast for the Marine Corps. I could list a whole lot of firsts, but what you what the question is not whether I was first. Why did it take so long to get us in there in the first place? It shouldn't have been that long, you know, so, but the, the bottom, bottom is, uh, there wasn't a lot that looked like me, Jack, but that didn't deter me from giving my all to be my best. You, you know, uh, you guys may think about all sorts of stuff. I was on a promotion board one time, and when I finished the promotion board, I'd go around the Army, <clears throat> and I'd talk uh, talk to people. And, you know, I was a sergeant major then. and talked to people about the promotion board. And, and I must have got the same question at least 20 times about uh, – I'd asked him, do you think minorities are selected over everybody else for promotions? And, and, and almost 100% of the people would raise their hand. And I'd say, no, that's not true. You're promoted based on your performance, what you have in your records. You, you know, it's, nobody's selected over anybody else. He said, well, you've got to have a certain percentage. That's not true. If, if there's a certain percentage of, of minorities that you, it's a goal, but if you don't reach that goal, they just write a letter and say, didn't achieve the goal but you're promoted based on your performance. I'm gonna ask you an additional question. <clears throat> what, what, you've probably been a mentor to a whole bunch of, of young, uh, young black kids that have came in the military or thinking about coming to the military. What's the one or two things that you tell them if they're gonna come in the military? As uh, If you're a minority, you're coming to the service, what, what's something that, advice I guess you'd, you'd give them? Uh, Vince, you want to? I see you not here. You want to start with you? Well, you know, I, I I'm going to make this a little bit more defined. Is that? Uh, and uh, yes, I have mentored many a black. Uh, male, female, uh, as well as uh, other peoples of color, uh, you know. So, so I don't say it as much more uh, different than I would say it to a white person, so forth. Because the key part that I bring out uh, in that mentoring aspect is about how you as an individual have to make it on your own. You get all of the help that you can, but you know, I'm the kind of guy that I prefer getting people to sort of build more within themselves. What are your personal core values? You learn what your personal core values are, you can make it. That's what helps you along the way. So this isn't an ingredient just to give to one specific race or, or gender. This is for everybody that I do. Uh, now I put my arm around, around a particularly an African American young man or young woman a, a lot more because particularly for those who are coming into the Coast Guard, uh, or interested in coming in Coast Guard is that there's still the shock that they don't see a lot of people that look like themselves. And the added on to that is two things. One is I made it. You can make it. And then I can go through a long line of other people who have done well in the Coast Guard that were uh, minorities and so forth. Alex Haley has one example that everyone uh, knows a household name from the book that he wrote and Roots. Uh, Jacob Lawrence, a uh, uh, famous uh, artist uh, uh, during the uh, 1940s and, and so on and so forth, uh, for also an African-American who's done exceptionally well. I will use those people as sort of examples to let them know that they entered into an organization where there was so few of them, but they became successful. And I kind of add that on. And that's kind of that little extra measure that I do when I talk uh, specifically uh, to African-Americans. 
Well, you, you know, you hit it on already. You, you just didn't, you just didn't uh, mentor African Americans. You mentored everybody. Absolutely. And that's exactly. I knew you. I knew you were going to say that before I started, because that's that's who you are. You know, that's and that's what your uh, your values are. So it wasn't just one group of people. It was everybody. But you wanted to coach and teach and mentor. Al, you want to add anything to that? Well, it's very simple, Jack. I was from a, a child taught to treat everyone as I would yeah. want to be treated. Uh, I wasn't taught to treat black people one way and and white people another way. I was taught to treat human beings with dignity and respect. That was that was required to live in my house, uh, in, in, in my mom's home. But I will tell you, I never wasted my time trying to uh, mentor one uh, person over another person by the color of the skin. I was looking to see if this guy could qualify or this young lady could qualify to be a member of the armed forces to be a yeah. qualified Marine. If they could be that, I didn't care what, what color, what gender they were, they were going to get the best guidance I had. And what I, you know, uh, one of the, one of the things that hurt me the most was I met a young, uh, one officer and he said he got out of the enlisted ranks and became a one officer because, because of me. And I said, well, that's great. He said, no, I got out because you, you ruined my dream. I wanted to be the first black sergeant major of the Marine Corps. And when you got it, I didn't want to be a sergeant major anymore. So, <laughs> wow. the, so we have to be able to display and honor ourselves across the board, not focus on one ind individual uh, ethnicity. But what I said to him, you haven't even made staff sergeant these six. So but it's going to be another three years before that and another another 15 years before you can even be possibly uh, compete for sergeant major. So you'd rather the society of the Marine Corps to stay stagnant, waiting on you to fulfill your dream. That's the most individual, selfish uh, thought I could. Maybe you are better off with the one option, you know, because, you know, I mean, it really bothered me that, that he would sacrifice himself of going forward. But the number one thing I, I mentor people about who wants to join the armed forces, and trust me, I will send them to the Army long before I send them to the Marine Corps if they're not good enough. No, I'm just kidding, Jack. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but the one one thing that I I, uh, I tell them, I ask them, what is your GPA? And they say, well, uh, I'm, I'm a 3.8. I'm a this. I'm a, no, that's your grade point average. The GPA that I want them to be focused on is their goals, their, uh, their plans, and action. You know, and if you're not, if you don't have a goal for yourself, you haven't written out a plan, visu uh, visually wrote a plan out, and you don't have the courage to take action to make it work. It doesn't matter whether you're in the military or you mopping floors at the train station, you will fail. So that's why, that's why I started to lift them up at how I can help them be successful, not how I can help them be the, uh, a great black Marine or a great female Marine, but how they can be a great uh, service to the Marine Corps. Yeah, you, you know, I I was talking to somebody the other day, and and uh, and I made a comment, and, and I hopefully they took it correctly. But but I told them I I don't see color. I see an American soldier. I see American Marine. I see American Coast Guard. I I see a person, an individual, uh, you know, and somebody I like or dislike. You don't have to be a particular color if I don't like you. Uh, but but uh, I I just I don't know that's always the way I always and you said at the beginning of the show Al I mean I just I believe in treating everybody the same I don't you know I don't like you I don't like you I love you I love you I mean that's the way life's got to be well so, it, you know, the thing that I do I do treat everybody the same if I like you I treat all the people I like the same if I don't like you I treat everybody I don't like the same and that's a, <laughs> <laughs> so I treat you the same you may not get the same treatment. <laughs> you mean you you must really like me because you give me crap all the time. I like that. Well, that's I love you. Hey, I, I want to talk about what inspired each one of you to join the military, but we gotta we gotta take a quick break. So hold that thought. Don't go anywhere. I know you're not gonna go anywhere. This is a great discussion. You're watching your next mission video podcast with me, your host, Jack L. Tilly, 12 Sergeant Made the Army. And don't forget, if you enjoyed this discussion, please like us. Click on that subscribe button below. Also, click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications of all of our upcoming video podcasts. 
I'll be right back after this word from our presenting sponsors. You're watching Your Next Mission video podcast, proudly presented by Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. And Purdue Global. You're ready for a comeback, and with Purdue Global, you can do more than take classes. You can take charge of your story, of your career, of your life. Earn a degree you can be proud of and get an education employer's respect. Start your comeback at purdueglobal.edu. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. We're talking with the 14th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Alfred L. McMichael, and the 8th Math Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Dr. Vince W. Patton. You're both, uh, you know, you're both told us a little bit about your backgrounds earlier. What about the beginning of your military? What inspired you to, to you know, to serve in the military? And Al, we'll start with you. Well, I have to be honest with you, Jack, that was not my uh, desire to join the military. It was during the Vietnam era. Uh, a lot of uh, young men of color were coming home, black guys that uh, I played ball with, uh, was returning home with, you know, with significant ill uh, injuries. So I wasn't interested in it. And then uh, all I wanted to do was go off and play football for Eddie Roberts, Robinson at, at Grambling uh, University. That's all I wanted to do. I thought I was better than, than the Doug Williams or the James Harris's that have uh, went before me and after me. That's where I want to go. But uh, they told me I was, uh, I was too small. I, you're not big enough to play down there. We, we have real men down here. And uh, we can give you a one-year scholarship, but we're not going to give you a full ride. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm better than all that garbage you have, but you're going to pass me by. So I went off to the recruiting office. Now, don't put this in writing. But I went down to recruiting office to join the Air Force. I thought that was the easy way to, to get a uniform, so I went down to the Air Force. But typical, typical reaction, the Air Force guy told me that he was going to lunch and come back later. And uh, so I said, well, my brother's in the Marine Corps, and he doesn't seem to bother uh, having any problem with it. So I'll, I'll stick my head in the uh, – and as I walked towards the Marine office, the recruiter, Marine recruiter came out and said, hey, come here, let me talk to you. Yeah, I think I got your brother in the Marine Corps. See, you think, look, I can give you a vacation. You can travel. You can go see Charlie. Uh, who the hell is Charlie? You know, he was talking about the Vietnam. And, <laughs> and so me, being being clever as I am, I said, well, I only want to do, uh, I, I want to serve in all, every branch of service. I want to do four years in the Army, four years in the Marine Corps, four years in the Navy, and four years in the Coast Guard, blah, 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 I mean, in the, in the Air Force. And he said, well, that's a good thought but let's try four years in one branch first and then and then if you want to do four years and really get uh, a military background join the marine corps so i said okay i'll do that and i went off and joined a lot of people think i joined the marine corps because my brother was in the marine corps and he had come home from vietnam he was well decorated and he was purple hard and bronze star and all this stuff but uh my brother's success never uh, fueled any fire for me to be anything uh, that I didn't want to be. So uh, when I told my brother I was going to join the Marine Corps, he said, you're not good enough to join the Marine Corps. you too, you too much of a whatever, you know, you would spell with a P and end with a Y. To, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. That's why you played football. You were the quarterback because nobody could touch you. You know, he gave me all the reasons. And plus, you cry too much, so you, you could never make it in the Marine Corps. So uh, he realized that I wasn't changing my mind. He said, well, come on, I'll go down with you so I can get uh, three extra days of liber uh, leave because he was home on leave from Vietnam. After he realized he couldn't change my mindset, he decided. But that wasn't what bothered me. What bothered me is my my teachers, the counselors at school, the, uh, the minister at church, and some of the elderly men, when they found out that I was not going to go to college and I was going to go in, in the Marine Corps, they all warned me against joining the Marine Corps. You know, you're not you're gonna be a bullet stopper. You're gonna come back with, in a body bag. Uh, the Marine Corps don't have black people in the Marine Corps. It's an all white organization. Well, during their time, that probably was true because the Marine Corps didn't didn't have blacks until 1942. So that's that's what they remembered the Marine Corps. Actually, that made it a bigger challenge for me. I can go do something that had never been done 
not only by myself, but by them. I could come back and be a hometown hero. I wasn't quite as profound as Vince. I just wanted to go show them that I could take on something they thought was too difficult and show them that I could prevail. Yeah. Vince, how about yourself? Well, <laughs> my story is, <laughs> I'm trying to shorten it because it's a longer story, but uh, from age 10, uh, my desire going in the military uh, first existed because of my oldest brother, who's eight years older than I am, uh, and he went in the Navy. And uh, he's sending me home all these pictures of life in the Navy and what he was doing, and uh, I wanted to do the Navy. In fact, I wanted to do everything my oldest brother did. Uh, he was great in school. That was my desire to be good in school because of him and so forth. So I wanted to continue to follow his footsteps. So on my 17th birthday, I'm a senior in high school, and there's a program in the military, which I believe is still in existence today, called the Delayed Enlistment Program. Where you can sign up as a senior uh, if you're at least 17 years old, and then after you graduate uh, from high school, you can go off into the military. So on my 17th birthday, uh, the proclamation was made that my b official birthday present was uh, for my parents to sign for me to go into the Navy. I go down to the federal building in downtown Detroit where all the Navy recruiters are. And at the end of the hallway sat a guy on the telephone wearing a Navy, you know, the blue Navy uniform. And uh, he was on the phone. So I made a beeline down to his office. As soon as I walked in, he looked at me and said, have a seat. I'll be right with you. And then I looked at the pictures on the wall. You know, Navy ships are gray. And the ships I saw were white. And it said Coast Guard. In fact, on the <laughs> door, it said Coast Guard. I walked into the wrong recruiting office. You see, back, uh -oh. back then, the Coast Guard uniform was the same as the Navy uniform. The hats were different, but we were indoors. And, of course, I didn't see the guy in a hat. So I'm too embarrassed to turn around and walk out because I'm one day over my 17th birthday. And I, I felt I wouldn't be cool if I said I made a mistake. So uh, I decided to pretend to listen to this Navy, this Coast Guard recruiter and, uh, and then go find the Navy recruiter. Well, he's on the phone talking. I'm wandering around. I'm looking at the pictures, start studying them. I'm finding them very fascinating. And then I come across a framed unit commendation uh, of one of, to this day, still the most heroic rescue case the Coast Guard had ever done back in 1952. And this thing read like a novel. And after I read it, I said, wow. And when I said, wow, the recruiter stopped his phone call, looked at me and said, I guarantee you can do something like that in your first four years in the Coast Guard. That's how I joined the Coast Guard. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! And he was right. Yeah. Two years into the Coast Guard, I got to do something of, of a similar nature. What I read on that that citation. Well, you, you got to tell what's the story about? You seen a picture up there? And it was a Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. Tell that story. Well, you know, okay. So two weeks in the boot camp. Uh, you know, while I'm going through the usual things that everybody do in in, uh, in basic training and boot camp, uh, I found this fascinating picture. Uh, a, a big portrait hanging on the wall in the barracks and uh, and they had spotlights on it and everything. So this guy obviously is special. And, uh, and he sort of had the rank of a master chief, which a master chief typically has two stars over what they call the crow or the eagle. And um, this guy had three stars. And so I just fascinated by looking at it because my book, my Coast Guardsman's Manual, or the Navy called it the Blue Jackets Manual, which has all the ranks, didn't show the rank of this three-star guy. So I go to my company commander, which is we call our drill instructor, to ask the question. I said, sir, there's a picture out on the quarter deck of what I think is a Master Chief, but he's got three stars instead of two stars. And my company commander, Chief Boston Mate, gets into my face. He says, that's the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. And uh, so, of course, you know, I've only been in the Coast Guard two weeks, you know, so you don't start asking those kinds of questions. But, but you know, Seaman Recruit Patton, uh, as, as curious as I was, decided to ask, well, what does he do? 
<laughs> and, and the, and the uh, uh, company commander gets back into my face and he says, he tells the commandant what to do. Well, I thought that was the coolest job in the Coast Guard. So fast forward uh, a few more weeks, because back then, boot camp was 10 weeks long. Back then, it wasn't until your seventh week before they would tell you what schools you qualified for. And so I sit down with my career counselor. He's going over all of the schools and what my my scores of what I qualified for. So Seaman Recruit Patton asked another amazing question. What school do I go to to become the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard? <laughs> and my company commander, who was just within earshot, hears me say this, and he's done on being a smart ass. So he comes over, and this is back in the days they could touch you. <laughs> Grabs me by the collar, yanks me out of the chair, marches me outside the door, and makes me do 50 push-ups. And I'm like, what did I do? What did I say? So and after I do the 50 push-ups, I snap back to attention. Now, this is Cape May, New Jersey, August, hot. And I'm sweating, and I snap back to attention. He gets back into my face, and he says, Patton, the day you become the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, that's the day I walk on clouds. Well, he was so right because he died two years before I became Master Chief for the Coast Guard. <laughs> oh, True story. You talk, I <laughs> hey, oh, that's a great story. Hey, you know, if you don't have family members who served, uh, who, who might inspire young people today to join, particularly, you know, young uh, people of color? Uh, who, who, would, who would inspire you? Uh, Al? Well, it's hard to say, Jack. I mean, uh, you know, it, it wasn't about, I grew up in an environment where the military just wasn't something that was, uh, you know, you kind of, there was other people that walked around saying, oh, that's Major Smith, you know, that's Colonel Jones. Uh, but they didn't look like me. So we didn't really, we thought that was something for someone else. First of all, the people that I knew that had served in the military was truck drivers and cooks, okay? Uh, so they didn't get to do combat. They didn't get to do these things. They, they were in World War II or Korean War, uh, but they, they didn't inspire you to do that. They inspired you to do something more, something greater. And a lot of uh, young men that, that fell from the, the path of doing things right would get pushed into the military because, yeah, well, you either join the military or go to, go to reform school or go to, go to jail. And that's kind of the vision. So I didn't put a lot of uh, focus on. Matter of fact, when I first came home from, from uh, basic training, a uh, guy told me, you joined the military? I said, yeah. He said, uh, man, you ain't even got no bars. All they did was put stripes on you. You know, you, <laughs> you, ain't, got, you ain't got no bars. And, and i never forget uh, a guy that was, uh, he was a jockey. He rode, he rode horses, and he was getting ready to pack up to go to Kentucky, to the Kentucky Derby. And he said, oh, I'm glad to see you home. How's the Salvation Army? I'd say, ain't no damn Salvation Army. I'm in the United States Marine Corps. But the environment of military wasn't that big. You know, nobody pushed you toward that. They pushed you to think other things in life. And so when I found the military and found that I could start off on equal ground or get an opportunity to prove myself as everybody that I was competing with, I felt, I felt at home. It, it was like being in the house that I grew up with. Yeah, same question, Vince. How about yourself? Well, you know, uh, I, I, for one, I'm very excited. Well, you had a family member that served anyway. You're right, exactly. So I had a family member, but I, but I will just go jump right into the excitement of, of serving in the military as a whole and how do I inspire others. And, uh, you know, Al knows this story pretty well because he and I visit down to the Outer Banks of North Carolina uh, annually uh, uh, as we do our little uh, – monkey business kind of thing. But uh, uh, there's a there's a fantastic story that uh, when I talk to young people, particularly about the Coast Guard, and especially when I'm talking uh, to African-Americans and so forth, th there's a, a great historical uh, story about uh, blacks in the Coast Guard from the Outer Banks. Uh, the, there was a Coast Guard station on Pea Island, which is just south of Kitty Hawk. And it was... Uh, uh, probably one of the most heroic rescue stations of of its time between 1890 to when it closed in 1947. And it was staffed by all blacks. And I love telling this story because uh, how it got to be an all black station 
was because when it was an all white station, uh, the, the crew members died when they went out to do the rescue cases. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the town of Manio, which was the biggest town where the station was, didn't want the government to shut the station down. So they decided to hire uh, uh, blacks to run the station. And, and mostly because it was uh, a dangerous place and they put the blacks there. Well, guess what happened? When the blacks took over, nobody died. And, yeah. but, but then for one, number two, the most heroic rescue cases that occurred, particularly in that era of time, occurred out of there. And I love telling that story. And, you know, as Al mentions, uh, every time we go down the Outer Banks, he knows I got to take the Mecca trip down to that area and so forth. So I love telling that story, which is the, the, uh, uh, the platform that I use to talk to people about interest in coming into the military as well as the Coast Guard. Because history is so important because, you know, as I told my story of walking into the wrong recruiting office, it was because of history that gave me the interest of the Coast Guard because after reading that commendation, you know, I saw myself in that picture that I could do that. And, uh, and all of the various stories that I hear about things that have gone on in the Coast Guard, especially that have occurred from people of color in our organization because we're such a small service, first of all, and a small service which has very few people of color across the board when they have done very significant and amazing things and so forth, that uh, that's, that's my vehicle to talk to people about going into the military. You know, it's, it's always a lot of fun just to talk to you guys because I learned so much. Uh, you know, I've talked to you over the, you know, we talked a little while ago about the, you know, probably 30 plus years. Every time I learn or talk to you, I learned something else that, that I didn't have any idea about. You know, we have a lot more to talk about, so stay right there. Don't go anywhere. You're watching your next mission video podcast. Here's a word from two more of our organization who make this show possible. You're watching Your Next Mission video podcast, brought to you in part by Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Dental, Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision. Part of transitioning out is that dental and vision insurance breaks off from your medical insurance. Vision and dental is very important to be able to enjoy your retirement. Blue Cross Blue Shield makes the transition so much easier. And USAA. A promise is a trust not to be broken. Whether spoken with an oath or sealed with a pinky. And after 100 years, we're still taking care of the military community and their families. That's our mission, always. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with the 14th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Alfred L. McMichael, and the 8th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Dr. Vince W. Patton III. Remember, this is your show. Tell us about your transition. Tell us what topics you'd like us to cover. You can call or text me at 844-424-1134 or send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. I said earlier that we've, uh, we've came a long way in the military when it comes to diversity, but uh, but your perspective might be different from mine. Vince, have we really came a long way? Absolutely. In fact, I, I mean, I can take this above and beyond just just a, uh, a, a racial color statement I, as I look at it from women. When I came in the Coast Guard in 1972, there were no women on active duty in the Coast Guard. Now, we had women in reserve, but not on active duty. When I left in 2002, we had two women uh, flag officers. We had, uh, I don't know how many, we had more than a dozen uh, master chiefs, E9, pay grade E9s, et cetera, and so forth. And then I look at even within the people of color perspective, okay, becoming the first African-American uh, uh, Master Chief of the Coast Guard uh, was significant in that particular piece. But I'm looking at all the people as they were coming along and how they were working and, and being helped uh, throughout the service. Uh, and I make that comparison to when I first came to the Coast Guard that, you know, it was kind of like, I, at least I felt, I was alone on the island by myself. But I had a lot of people that helped me along the way, particularly people who weren't black. Because uh, I didn't see... Or, or work with anybody of, of my particular color until after my first four years in the Coast Guard. Uh, 
But I, so I've seen so much change that have occurred, not just from the time that when I retired in 2002, but as I look at even today, the Coast Guard is about to get its first African-American uh, woman admiral uh, uh, this year uh, in April. She's going to make uh, one star admiral. And, you know, and I knew her from when she first came in the Coast Guard way back when. So I, that has been sort of my gauge of seeing success that we've come a long way. Are we there yet? Oh, no, let's not look at this, that we've seen those successes of a first African-American in the Coast Guard, first African-American admirals or whatever the case may be. Uh, there's still more to do. And a lot of that has to be with uh, we got to build the pool build the pool of people to come in for the future and look at our future within our service. But uh, I, and what that means is let's not rest on our laurels. Uh, I'm happy with what I see, but there's always more to do. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a balancing act too. You know, you got to make sure you're fair for both sides. You know what I mean? It's, it's a balance. Al, Al, same question. Have, have we, uh, you know, have we really came that far? Have we went a long ways, or do we have more to do? Or? Well, yeah, we always have more to do because the the uh, the book has never had a period at the end of the last page. It's always another chapter to be written. Let's take it back to the founding fathers. You know, when we talk about the the, the founding fathers, you don't think about people that look like me, but now today you do because people are beginning to move up the ranks. You talked about uh, Secretary Powell. But they, we got a secretary of defense that looks like me. We got a chairman of the Joint Chief that looks like me. Okay, so it has changed. It has changed in more ways than just in, in ethnicity and, and color. When you look at, I mean, the, the military and the Department of Homeland Security and, and uh, the Department of Veteran Affairs has a new, new letter in the alphabets called D uh, for deportation. And, and the reason they, they are focused on that is because there's so many non-citizen uh, uh, veterans. A matter of fact, America has about 300,000 non-citizen veterans that have raised their hand to take an oath of uh, enlistment to join the military. And now they're focused on how to take care of these people, especially with the borders and so forth, so that they don't get caught up in the same uh, uh, processes that the illegal immigrants may come. These people have served. They've served in the military. They've gotten, matter of fact, you you know, they, they even focused on the fact that I didn't know we had 18% uh, uh, of uh, uh, our Medal of Honor recipients uh, are non-citizen, non, uh, uh, they're immigrants, you know. So, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, but these are the types of changes that we're making. Women are being able, females are being able to be promoted in the ranks and not uh, stifled to just be in a certain category, wearing lipstick and, and, and pumps. You know they're they're on the battlefield. They're they're leading. They're I was fortunate enough to have the first three star female uh, uh, be the sergeant major for the first three star female in the Marine Corps. You know, and and uh, sure she was a little sharp about certain things, but what she had to go through to get there made her a little more aggressive about uh, making things work than the average Joe. But nobody was better leader than her, and I I, I admire her, respect her today. Uh, you know they. The women are getting out of the service. You hear, hear uh, the VA talk about uh, PTSD, and they they focus on men that have it. The women got health care, health issues uh, that in the military that they are focusing on now to help them. The incarceration of veterans in, in our institution, state and federal. We got about 18% 18, uh, 18 of our uh, veterans in America that has served in prison, either at the state level or the federal level. And all of these things have shown progress because now we care about them. Now we're building programs to take care of them. We're looking outside of uh, just take the hill because I said so. We, you know, all of us, uh, Dr. Patton, you, you, SMA, Tilly, and myself and others have worked diligently on the transition assistance. Well, you know, uh, we teach classes about that, how we used to get out of the military and you get a pamphlet. Now you get education. It's better, but it's not complete. 71% of the people that transition said they, they started the transition program late. 41% of them said they never completed it. So there's room to be uh, tuned up, but at the same time, we're making progress. You know, you've got to go, uh, you've got to uh, work your way 
through things, but you just can't work your way into things and because that's the only way the butterfly, you know, you get in the caterpillar. I mean, you're in the cocoon. You got to come out the other end to be a, a butterfly. Well, we're not quite the butterfly yet, but we're, we're going, through, we're getting through the, the cocoon. Yeah. You, you know, I was going to ask you about history. You already answered that question. How do we educate ourselves to make the military home for everybody? And I think you've answered that question too, by just, by just talking to people and telling them what's going on, what they expect, what's, what's out there for everybody. Do we need to do a better job at educating people about the military, especially minorities? I guess? Absolutely, not just minorities, but Americans, period. Uh, the military struggles with recruitment. And a lot of that is because the propaganda of what the military is not doing for you, rather than telling them what they can do for you. People like the three of us know what the military can do for you, how it changed our life, how it made our life more productive, made it better. We would be, well, at least I would be, I would be a hopeless case if it hadn't have been for the military that gave me the, the, the guardrails to stay in a path that could get me to success. You know, so uh, we just have to be careful of, of not getting wrapped up in, in, I hate to use the word political things, get wrapped up in the propaganda of people that talk uh, uh, dinner table talk, but not talking facts and poisoning the minds of the young people that believe that it's not worth their time. Jack, Vince, and myself, we went through the Vietnam era. We knew how it was to come home and get spat on. We knew how it was to go to town and couldn't wear your uniform. You had to sneak into USO or somewhere and change in civilian clothes and put your, put your uniform in a locker so that you could be treated as every other American that walked to Disneyland. I was in California, so I said Disneyland. We go, we go to Anaheim. We couldn't go in our uniform and get the same treatment. We got, we got mistreated. Well, I could tolerate it more than my best friend, who was a, a six foot one redhead from Oklahoma. And he couldn't understand why are they so nasty to us. We're in the military. Boy, please, they've been nasty to me all my life. So I'm, I ain't worried about being nasty. I'm worried about what I can get out of it before they kick me out, you know? So if they wasn't careful, I'd probably have picked their pockets before they kicked me out. That's between us. But, uh, yeah, yeah. but, uh, but uh, the point was, uh, I was a little more prepared for rejection than he was. He saw rejection and felt bad. I saw rejection as a redirection. Yeah. And can I add, you, you can, know, can I, can I, yeah, can go I ahead. Absolutely. Uh, you Absolutely. know, yeah. and particularly with uh, what, you know, military history is American history. And, yeah. and I, I mean, and I, I can't uh, overemphasize that enough because as we look at the, the holistic view of American history. It is not without what our military has done to help bring the success of this country. And, and that's how we need to be more in getting young people interested in about the military is that it has become the foundation of our country and the things of what we have to do. The military history is very, very important. Uh, all six branches, has something to offer in terms of talking about how the historical significance has helped to promote this country and being how it is today. Well, you know, Jack, when I was yeah. at the Go ahead. when I was on at the University of Minnesota, the uh, uh, NROTC program, I wasn't as focused on getting my midshipmen through the program. I knew my teacher would get them. I was more involved in outreach programs to help the students on the campus of University of Minnesota understand that we were not misfit. Just because we got up in the morning and ran PT, just because three days a week we wore a uniform, that was nothing to hate. And trust me, in Minnesota, it's like being on a, a, a cousin to California. You know, there's a very, very liberal, liberal uh, environment and no disrespect, but uh it was more to me to help them understand you should be proud of these young men and women, not criticizing them because uh, of what they do. And that's life itself. That's why I'm very focused on forefathers. I'm very focused on the founding fathers. You know, uh, if you want people to join the military, you got to tell the black history story about the black forefathers. You got to tell the black history story about the, uh, the black uh, uh, founding fathers. You know, you might know some of them, but, you don't know enough about the contributions they serve. You know, we live in a country that has been protected and, and defended by the Constitution, but the president tells you to go do it, you go do it. You know, so we've got to be more vigil about telling the history of our, our people and not telling the history of 
cherry picking who we think is nice to talk about. Hell, everybody know George Washington. But do you know George Washington Carl? Yeah. You, you one of the one of the things we don't do a very good job about either is is uh is telling a military story uh, to the country. I mean we don't we, we you know we can get out uh, Unfortunately, all we ever hear is negative stuff about the military. We need to do a better job. We talk about history. We need to do a better job about educating our country about the sacrifices uh, that our military makes. The other thing I'll tell you, and I said it a little while ago, is that uh, there's, there's every, you, me, every, all of us, we change coming in the military. Uh, we look at things differently. We see things differently. Uh, we're all one. I, I said something to somebody one time, and he said, I, I don't never see a color, because I don't. I mean, I see a friend, I see a, a, a patriot, I see somebody that was risking, risk, uh, willing to risk their life to protect our country. And I think sometimes we forget about that. And I wish we'd do just a, a better job about educating people about uh, you know, what we do. And, and the other thing I wish, I wish everybody in this country would have the same kind of relationships that we have. You know, now we, may, we may bicker and fight and pick on each other, but I, I guarantee if you've got a problem, I got a problem, you know? So it's, it's, it's those kind of relationships that I wish, that I wish people would uh, see and I wish I could educate people a little bit more about them. That's what, and that's really, quite frankly, that's what this show is gonna do, is do all we can to educate people about, you know, about uh, Black History Month, but also about you and your sacrifices and the thing that you've done, so. Well, I, you know, we, we go I'm, ahead. I'm proud to hear that, Jack, because uh, Black History, is just a part of American history. Absolutely. And when you only tell, cherry pick the parts that you want to think and leave out black history, are you really telling the American story? And and that's a, dis, a disrespect to my grandkids and their grandkids that they only have to learn about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. But Abraham Lincoln wouldn't have been nothing without Frederick Douglass. Okay, so, you know, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt wouldn't have been anything you know, with, without George Washington Carver or, or Booker T. Washington or, or whatever the case may be. So we don't really realize how much we interacted to help America grow and, and build America. On the other part, like Vince said, my success wasn't because I had a host of black people around me lifting me up. My success was because I had a lot of great people around me that saw my value. My greatest disappointment in the whole, uh, in my whole career was when I was a E2 at Pearl Harbor at the Marine Barracks, uh, Honolulu, uh, Hawaii. And I had an E6 that chewed my butt from the time I got off the plane in Honolulu to, I mean, just for, I just thought he just picking on me. I mean, everything, I mean, I couldn't do nothing right. He was all over me. And one day I was talking to a young lad from uh, Chicago, David Garcia, who had just got out of the brig. And we were on our way to the chow hall, and I was complaining. I, you know, Staff Sergeant Tronson is a BS. He, he so, you know, he don't like me. He just all over me. And he stopped. And David was about Jim Hart, Jim Hart, Jim Hurt height. I mean, about five, five. But uh, he said, <laughs> you know, little legs would swing on, if he sat on a stool, they wouldn't even touch the floor. But he stopped and he looked me in the eye and he said, you're the biggest fool I've ever seen. You're complaining about someone trying to get to get you to get ahead. You're complaining. And, and of course, Tronson, the staff sergeant was white. And he said, he's on your butt. If someone had stayed on my butt like that, I wouldn't have spent three months in the brig. You are lucky that he saw enough in you to, to, to put his hands around you, uh, arms around you in, in his teaching and his pushing and demanded his request and requirement of you to do excellent. That was my biggest failure that I didn't see this man was trying to help me and not hold me back. Matter of fact, I was meritoriously promoted three times under his command. Meritoriously promoted me that I was accelerated over my peers, me and another guy named Toby L. Hawkins. And, uh, we went to the top because of this E6. And then we ended up, I was an E8 first sergeant. He was an E8 master sergeant together. Not only did he get me to be promoted, but he helped me get to a level above what he was. 
that's what I'm my biggest disappointment that I didn't see grace staring me in the face because I was so busy trying to think that someone was trying to take something for me. Sometimes you got to open your aperture and realize when people chew your butt about uh, being more than what you are, to do a better job than you're doing, reach for the stars and not settle for crumbs when you can own the bakery. Listen to them because they may just be trying to help. you. Yeah. You know, you know, we could talk about this for hours because this is a great discussion for us to talk about. But we don't have hours, unfortunately. So uh, any final thoughts, anything that uh, you'd like to share? Al, we'll start with any final thoughts, any final thoughts you want to share with the audience? I, I would say uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of a, an institution, an organization that still wants to focus on Black History uh, Month. Uh, because it is vitally important, even though it didn't start off as a month, it started off the week, and uh, it ended up 1970, 71, become a, a whole month to educate not black people, but all people about what black people has contributed to the country. So what I would have to say is don't fall in love with good and let the greatness of this nation pass you by by eliminating the contributions of all Americans that have contributed to it. Oh, well said. Vince, how about yourself? Well, I couldn't say it any better than the way Al has pointed, no. but I, but I, I'll add with uh, you know as I had made a comment earlier with regards to personal core values and the importance of that. You know, if we peel back Black history stories, and I and I don't mean just military, but just look at everything across across the board of what that all came about. What motivated people to do what they did, especially the early years? of black Americans in this country that under the, uh, the, the, the constant issues that they face, but they were able to excel. What and how made them tick to make it happen is personal core values. And I'd say that that's so important that I would like to leave this at, if nothing else, you don't have to be enamored with understanding all about black history or anything like that. But read a couple of stories. Read George Washington Carver. Uh, uh, read about Frederick Douglass. Read about some of the other people. And But most importantly, let it get into your head what motivated them to do and be what they did. And it was through their personal core values. And I'll, and I'll end it one with uh, my favorite quote that I often use, which defines my personal core values, uh, from uh, the great soccer player Pele. And, and he said, Success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, but most of all, love of what you're doing or learning to do. And that's what I've always looked at for myself, as well as I looked at for those individuals of the past who helped make our country strong. Wow. Wow. Hey, first, first of all, let me... Uh... Let me thank both of you for coming on the show. You know, you you know, I I uh, I love you like brothers. I shouldn't say that because now you're going to try to get some money from me. But I love you like brothers. <laughs> but uh, I just appreciate uh, your friendship and uh, what you do and what you have done for this country and what you continue to do. So I just uh, I just appreciate you uh, coming on the show and thank you so much for your comments today. It, uh, it certainly was inspiring for me and I'm sure it's inspiring for a lot of uh, a lot of other people too. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Jack. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks again to Sergeant Major McMichael and Master Chief Patton for being with us today. It was just great having them on the show. I'm Jack Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army. You've been watching your next mission video podcast, and thank you for joining us. Log on to our website at yournextmission.org and leave me a review. I always say I hope it's a good review, but if it's a bad one, please send it to me. While you're there, you can visit our nonprofit and corporate partners who have jobs and services available that will assist you in your transition from the military. We've also added a new job board in partnership with Recruit Military that'll allow you to search for a job that's just right for you. Check out this video on our website to learn how to fine tune your search. You can also create individual profile by scanning the QR code on the screen or the one on your website. Also, information collected is confidential and will not be shared. Please know we're here to help you, and this is another way for us to do that. You can also follow me on all my personal social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, or X, as it's now called, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Rumble. And if you like what we're doing here, click on that subscribe button below, and don't forget, 
Also, click on the bell to receive notifications of all of our upcoming podcasts. Remember, we want to hear from you. Leave me a message or send me a text at 844-424-1134. Send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. Thanks again to Sergeant Major McMichael and Master Chief Patton for, for joining us today. And I think uh, Al and Vince, and that's what I'm going to call you, sort of said it today. You know, black history is American history, and we all need to learn about those things and understand that, uh, you know, what's important for all of us, not just one side or the other side. You know, it's about, uh, it's about life. It's about our country. It's about uh, a way of life sometimes we take for granted. You know, Al and Vince I've known for probably, I don't know, 35 years. And really, I call them my brothers. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. But we understand each other. And we do love each other. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks to New Mind Studios and, of course, our sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, Blue Cross Blue Shield, FAP Dental, Blue Cross Blue Shield, FAP Vision, and USA. We appreciate all you do for our military. And as always, see you on the high ground. hoo You've been listening to Your Next Mission, brought to you by the American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.